ready to put on your best Regency era slippers. We're taking a deep dive into Jane Austen's world today. Think grand balls, witty banter, and a whole lot of societal rules we'd probably find, well, a little much today. Oh, absolutely. But that's part of the fun, isn't it? Austen was a master of social observation. Her novels give us this amazing glimpse into the lives and, let's be honest, the dramas of the English gentry centuries ago. Right. Like, we're not just talking about love stories here. It's about inheritance, reputation, and the pressure to make a good marriage that could make or break your entire family. Exactly. So let's jump right into it with Pride and Prejudice, shall we? We're dropped right into the thick of it with the Bennett family. Five daughters, a mother on a mission to see them married off. I was going to say, Mrs. Bennett practically starts planning the wedding when a wealthy bachelor moves into the neighborhood. I know. Mr. Bingley doesn't even get to unpack his bags before she's decided he's the answer to all their prayers. It's almost comical, right? It is, but you have to remember the societal context here. For a family like the Bennetts, especially with no son, to inherit the estate. Oh, right, because that whole entail thing? Exactly. Marrying off their daughters, preferably well, wasn't just tradition. It was practically an economic necessity. So Mrs. Bennett's relentless matchmaking, it's less about romance, more about securing her daughter's futures. Precisely. And Austin doesn't shy away from that. Remember Mrs. Bennett's reaction when she first hears Bingley is single. What a fine thing for our girls. Subtlety was not her strong suit. Not at all. But hold on. It's not like all the Bennett daughters are on board with this whole marriage frenzy, are they? Definitely not. You've got Jane, the eldest, who represents a more idealistic view of love. She genuinely falls for Bingley, attracted to his character, their connection. It's refreshing compared to some of the other characters, right? Totally. And then there's Charlotte Lucas, Elizabeth's friend. She's got a much bleaker outlook on marriage. Remember that line of hers? Don't try to hide your feelings because he must find it out. Like, ouch. Even if it makes sense, given their circumstances, yeah. got a punch to the gut. It is. It highlights just how limited their options were. Attracting a husband wasn't just about happiness for women like Charlotte. It was about survival, plain and simple. So we've got Mrs. Bennett scheming, Jane falling head over heels, and then there's Elizabeth. How does she fit into all of this? Yeah. Because she doesn't exactly strike me as the type to swoon over a wealthy bachelor. Ah, oh, Elizabeth. She's our independent spirit, watching this whole social dance unfold with a, a healthy dose of skepticism. And of course... Her trademark wit. Which she doesn't hesitate to use. Remember that first encounter with Mr. Darcy? He pretty much calls her just tolerable. Yeah. Talk about missing the mark, right? It's almost painful to read. I mean, who says that? But here's the thing. That's Austin at her most clever. Because just as we're forming our own opinions of Mr. Darcy, we're introduced to Wickham. Oh, Wickham. Right. And he is charming. Oh, he's very good. Yes. He's very good. And he's got this whole wrong gentleman thing going on. And you almost can't help but feel for him. Yeah, you kind of are on his side at it's, the beginning. And so is the town. Yes. They all fall for this. This whole act. Yeah. And that's the genius of Austin. Mm -hmm. Wickham is a master manipulator. Yes. He's crafted this image of himself as the victim of Darcy's cruelty. Right. And it works. Yeah. Because it plays into Elizabeth's and everyone else's prejudices. It does. It's like watching a train wreck in slow motion. Exactly. You know what's happening. You know the truth, but you just have to watch it all play out. You can't stop it. You can't stop it. Okay, so then we get to Lydia. Okay. Lydia's elopement with Wickham. Oh, dear Lydia. A scandal that threatens to completely destroy the entire Bennett family. Well, it's interesting because this is really what was at stake yes. for women at the time. Exactly. Especially with no dowry. Right. I mean, if you made a bad marriage... Your family could be ruined. Mrs. Bennett completely falls apart. I know. She says that Lydia is lost forever. You can just feel the weight of these societal expectations just crushing down on them. And can you imagine? It wouldn't have just been whispers. Oh, absolutely not. It would have been like the talk of the town. Front page news. Exactly. And with no way to contact them, no way to really know what was happening. It's just awful. And Wickham with this history of gambling debts and just shady behavior. Not exactly husband material. No. Not the picture of responsibility. Not at all. So this is where Austin throws us a curveball. Because who comes in to save the day? Of all people. Mr. Darcy. Mr. Darcy. The person you would least expect. The one who everyone thought, even Elizabeth, was cold and arrogant. Stoic and aloof. Yes. 
he secretly takes care of everything. Arranges and finances their marriage. Yes. Protects the Bennett family from complete ruin. Even though it costs him dearly. So, it's a complete plot twist. Talk about a change of heart. And suddenly, we start to see a different side of him. Right. All those assumptions we had. All those judgments we made. Based on absolutely nothing. On nothing. And here he is, the one who shows up when it really counts. Yes. Actions speak louder than words. Right. I mean, he could have just let it all fall apart. He could have. He could have just washed his hands of the whole thing. But he didn't. But he didn't. And I think this is where we start to see a shift. In how we see him and how Elizabeth sees him. So how does Elizabeth even begin to process this? I mean, the man she's written off as proud and arrogant and just generally unpleasant is the one who saves her family from ruin. And not only that, he doesn't brag about it. No. Nobody even knows until he tells Elizabeth in a letter. That letter. Okay, so we have to talk about the letter. It's basically a literary masterpiece. Because he doesn't hold back. No, he lays it all out there. Yes. He's just completely honest. But in a way that's respectful, too. Yes. He acknowledges her good qualities, even as he's criticizing her family. It's almost like he's saying, I see you, <laughs> I see your worth, even when others don't. Exactly. And that's what gets to Elizabeth. That honesty, that vulnerability, it's what starts to break down those walls of prejudice she's built up. It's a turning point for her, for sure. So then we get to Darcy's second proposal. Oh, the second proposal. And this time it's different, isn't it? It's completely different. It's like all those walls of pride and prejudice have just started to crumble. And what's so striking is how much Darcy has changed. Right. That's like he's a completely different person. He's humble. He's sincere. Gone is that haughty, arrogant man from those early chapters. He even acknowledges his past behavior, how he misjudged Elizabeth. Instead of just, you know, expecting her to fall at his feet because he's, well, Mr. Darcy. Exactly. And I think that's what gets to Elizabeth. She realizes she misjudged him, too. It's like they both had to confront their own flaws, their own prejudices, before they could truly see each other. And accept each other for who they really are. So this time, it's not a resounding no, right? This time, she says yes. But of course... Austin wouldn't let them off that easy. No. Enter Lady Catherine de Bourgh. Oh, Lady Catherine. Darcy's aunt, who shows up. Determined to stop the wedding. Because how dare Darcy marry someone like Elizabeth, right? She's horrified. It's like Austin took every snobbish, aristocratic stereotype and poured it into this one character. And she even tries to bully Elizabeth into breaking things off. But Elizabeth stands her ground. Which, let's be honest, takes guts. I mean, this is the woman who could make your life miserable if you crossed her. She had a lot of power. But Elizabeth or... refuses to be intimidated. She knows her own worth. She loves Darcy, and she's not about to let some overbearing aunt dictate her future. It's really a powerful moment seeing her defy these societal expectations. It's like she's saying, I'm not going to be defined by your narrow view of the world. And Darcy, he chooses Elizabeth. Despite his aunt's objections. Family drama be damned. He's chosen love. It's almost like a rebellion against this rigid class system. Right. Like they've broken free from these societal constraints. And in their own way, so have Jane and Bingley. They found their own happy ending. So we have these two couples seemingly starting their happily ever after. But of course, this is Austin, so it's not all sunshine and roses. No, there's always a touch of realism, isn't there? Even in their happiness, they still have to navigate the complexities of their world. And the complexities of their families. Especially their families. Like... I'm thinking of Lydia. Oh, Lydia. Who seems completely oblivious to the seriousness of her actions. She's more concerned with dancing and finding husbands for her sisters. It's almost like she hasn't learned anything. And Mrs. Bennett, she's still fixated on appearances. Social status, grand houses, all of it. It's like she completely misses the emotional core of what's happened. But maybe that's the point, right? Austin isn't trying to give us a fairy tale. No. She's giving us a glimpse into the realities of her time. The complexities of love, family, society, all of it. And she does it with wit, with irony, with a healthy dose of social commentary. So why do you think centuries later are we still so drawn to Pride and Prejudice? I think it's because Austin captured something timeless, these universal experiences we all share. Love loss, the desire for connection, the struggle to break free from expectations. And she reminds us that first impressions can be deceiving. And that sometimes the greatest journeys are the ones we take within ourselves. Learning to confront our prejudices, our pride, our own blind spots. And she does it all in such a clever, engaging way. So as we close the book on this deep dive, what's the one thing you hope our listeners take away from Pride and Prejudice? 
that even in a world obsessed with appearances, it's the connections we forge, the choices we make that truly define us. Beautifully said. And on that note, we'll wrap up this deep dive. Until next. Keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep those pages turning.